uh, Eswatini is, is a very small country. A lot of our um, a lot of our readers would not be familiar with it. But mm. in that case, all the more reason to to um, to expose this, to write about it. Um, and and Swaziland, uh, although it's not generally thought of as one of those sorts of tax havens up there with um, with uh, say the Cayman Islands um, or Seychelles or whatever, there are certain we're we're seeing what we see in the leaks are certain sort of uh, similar characteristics. Um, and what we saw is how powerful individuals were exploiting vulnerabilities in the Swazi system, in the Swazi financial system, in the case of this bank, for instance, or the or gold refineries, these fictitious gold refineries. Okay. Um, I, okay. um, I hope you can hear me properly as well. Yeah, okay. So um, to our audience today, we are joined. Uh, I know that in Swaziland, the talk of town in beer halls, in people who are seated and cuddling in relationships, the major talking point are the leaks, the Swazi leaks about the financial intelligence unit uh, reports that have been reported by several journalists all over the world. And we are told that as much as 89,000 documents have been leaked and they tell a story of a rock state. They tell a story of uh, a vulnerable uh, banking system, a vulnerable economy, but also more than anything, they tell a story of a, a, a very sophisticated local and international syndicate uh, involved in gold and illicit gold uh, smuggling. They talk, they talk about issues of um, uh, banking licenses being issued against recommendations by the central bank and with politicians using their power to influence uh, decision making they are i mean these documents and these reports that we have heard they talk about almost everything that matter to us as a country as a state and also as an institution uh, as a as a country with institutions that will keep our our um, our monetary financial uh, institutions in proper and that make it even easy for international organizations to transact and to trust that we do the right thing uh, when it comes to those things. So um, we had to hunt, uh, really not so much as hunt, but we had to get some of the people who were involved in these stories. And I'm happy, I'm happy to be joined by Martha Reddy and Henny who is in Cape Town, if I'm not mistaken. I'm both in Cape Town or in Swaziland, in, in Jobe. But I'm, maybe in, jo I'm in Jobe. <laughs> I'm in Cape Town. Not Swaziland right now. <laughs> <laughs> so these two esteemed gentlemen uh, are friends of the people of Swaziland, but also they are friends of the truth. They are friends of uh, uh, transparency and especially economic crimes that elites in government and private sector are in, uh, do in order to undermine institutions of the state and be able to benefit themselves and their pockets and families and friends at the expense of the majority of people. So I joined today to have a conversation. And I would like uh, my honorable guests just to introduce themselves briefly, and then we'll take the conversation from there. Uh, okay, I'll, I'll go first. I'm Micah Reddy. I'm uh, the Africa coordinator and a journalist at the International Consortium of Investigative Journalists. Um, and when I tell you a little bit more about the leaks, I'll tell you a bit more about what we do. Beautiful. Th thanks, Magnoba. My name is Henny van Vieren. Uh, I work at a nonprofit organization called Open Secrets, and we investigate economic crime and related human rights abuse with a strong focus on the private sector. And it's great to be here with you and the, the bridge viewers as well. So thank you. Beautiful. Um, I'm just going to start with you, Henny. You have not just, uh, people may may know or may not know this, but you've done several work outside of Swaziland in the region as well. You must tell us a bit about your work outside of these recent leaks in the country and what you and the organization do and what you have done in South Africa and outside of South Africa as well. Certainly, yeah. So, so we're we're not as large an organisation as the ICIJ, and uh, but we we work from South Africa, focusing um, on on the role of the private sector in, as I said, economic crime and human rights abuse. Um, our our work 
you know, is very much focused to links in South Africa because we undertake investigations, we undertake campaigning, advocacy work, and then try and seek legal accountability and obviously use the, the legal framework often in South Africa to try and, and hold primarily corporations and regulators to account who have failed people. And certainly we've had a number of important cases that speak to the global nature of economic crime and human rights abuse. Um, and Mangamoba, just to answer you know, your question more directly, some of the, the maybe mentioned two or three of those are more recent pieces of work. Um, one has been on the role of uh, German companies who have been using South Africa as, an, as a conduit um, to uh, manufacture weapons that were used against civilians in the war in Yemen over a number of years, particularly by the United Arab Emirates and forces from Saudi Arabia. Um, work we've done on uh, on the Rwandan genocide and looking at South African arms dealers who were implicated in that genocide, and we are uh, holding we are looking to, to hold those enablers, those people who, who profited from those crimes, to account. And most recently, um, an important piece of work where we, we work together with uh, another civil society organisation called the Sentry, uh, and investigated a group of people around the president of Zimbabwe. Uh, um, Emerson and Gagwa, and uh, particularly how the network was uh, channeling money out of Zimbabwe using lawyers and bankers in South Africa, in Mauritius, and in the, in the United Kingdom, and exposing those and looking at how we can hold a lot of those uh, various actors to account. So uh, our, our interest, too, is very much um, in the region and understanding how South Africa as a country is connected to the world and how we need to work together to resolve some of those issues. So do you just work with just exposing those things and... Um and just leaving, you say do campaigning as well, but I'm just worried, I'm just interested, do you take, do you do any litigation and stuff like that? Absolutely. We, we litigate. Um, we we approach the various regulatory authorities. We've taken regulator, regulatory authorities to court where they haven't litigated in the interests uh, of of people who have been affected by economic crime and, and human rights abuse. So um, we've got a record now of of litigation, we have, uh, we have a great group of lawyers on our team and we work with public interest lawyers uh, to bring cases to court or, or to use other legal strategies. So, you know, we, we kind of see that as part of the solution. I think it's a little bit a little bit different from the way that some investigative journalists understandably work, which is to, un to unearth, and maybe Mike can talk a little bit about, you know, their approach. Ours is to say, um, yes, we are in a sense agenda driven because we want to obtain the truth and then we want to try and seek account or show the institutions that this is how one can build cases. Because I think our problem in many of our countries is that, you know, even the good prosecutors that there are don't either have the resources or almost have lost the imagination that we can take on the powerful. And, and our point is particularly the powerful in the private sector, who's, you know, whose influence is growing in all of our, our spaces um, need to be tackled and we need to find the ways to do it. And we need to use this thing, supposed thing called the rule of law as it exists to do that. Oh, that's beautiful. Micah, you introduce yourself to the people of Sutherland in this explosive way. <laughs> so tell us more about your work and your organization. So the ICIJ is uh, a non-profit investigative consortium. Uh, we work with partners across the world, uh, across time zones, across continents. So we have... Uh, on this project, we had seven partner centers working with us. There were nearly 40 journalists. You may have heard the name ICIJ before in relation to um, similar big leaks where we're talking of, you know, hundreds of thousands or even millions of documents um, that require a lot of uh, eyes and a lot of brain power and a lot of journalists, you know, to, to, just to make sense of those leaks and produce stories on them. So. Some of our, our big um, uh, household projects, Panama Papers, Paradise Papers, the FinCEN files, uh, ICIJ played a critical role in, in um, bringing together teams of journalists from across the world. Um, uh, you you uh, gave the figure of 89,000 um, files in Swazi Secrets. In fact, the, number, the, the actual number was 10 times that. It was 890,000. So, you know... You can't you can't leave that to uh, one little uh, poorly funded journalism center or a, a little group of journalists to make sense of right. You need resources. You need uh, you need you need collaboration. And realistically, 
uh, when it comes to investigative journalism, collaboration is the future. These sorts of leaks are becoming more and more commonplace. They're becoming the mainstay of a lot of investigative journalism, especially when we're talking about um, secrecy jurisdictions, tax havens, um, countries like Eswatini, where, where information access is very difficult. The information is there. Getting it is very difficult. And when we get it, it often, it's a case of when it rains, it pours. So suddenly we're sat with, you know, vast, vast quantities of information. And making sense of that requires uh, journalists with local knowledge, journalists with, you know, uh, specialized skills in understanding illicit financial flows, data teams, uh, lawyers, the, the works. I mean, you really need uh, a, a great collaborative effort to do justice to, to a leak like this. So that's ICIJ's sort of specialty. Uh, we also produce a lot of our own reporting. So, uh, so we wrote stories for this as well that we publish on our website. Um, but the real kind of value add uh, that ICIJ brings is, is networking, and we bring together journalists from across the world. Um, and as I was saying, you know, th this, is, this is really the future of investigative journalism. Uh, increasingly, journalism is, is under pressure, uh, the financial models are under strain, um, and journalists are having to do a lot more with, with a lot less. Uh, newsrooms are shrinking, and, and and often the first to go uh, within media organisations are investigative outlets because they're expensive. Um, you know, you need skilled, uh, you need highly skilled reporters, and uh, good investigative units often only produce. You know, uh, they they produce very few stories, a few stories a year, if that. Um, they're hard hitting stories, but it's not the kind of like. Uh, you know, it's it's a real investment, and it's not the kind of sort of uh, the, the sort of daily bread and butter stories that that um, it's often seen as kind of like a luxury, right? Having these investigative centers, these investigative units within within, say, a newspaper. And so, what we've seen historically is that they're the first to be kind of to be cut um, because they're so because they're so expensive, and because it's it's hard to sort of measure the sort of financial uh, it's hard to measure the the economic value um the the sort of material value of public interest journalism and real sort of investigative journalism right um if you look at like your big publications uh your big dailies uh it's the sort of it's the daily news stuff it's the it's 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 you know other stories that kind of bring the clicks and the eyeballs and that sell newspapers. Yeah, Often yeah. investigative journalism would, but but it's it's much it's harder to to sort of measure the value of investigative journalism. And so increasingly yeah. we're seeing nonprofits and that sort of thing. And that's where ICIJ comes in. Increasingly, collaboration is is becoming the norm. That's true. So were you always so so how do you get to target any institution or government that you're looked? Does it does you you wait for that information to land on your lap, or you say, okay, let's look at something in Ethiopia, and then you go the whole year looking there and hoping to find something? How just take us through how would, for example, initiating a story of Swaziland come about? It's it's it really depends. I mean, it's partly a responsive, it's partly a reactive thing, and it's partly proactive. Um, it depends on the story. So, for instance, we know that um, deforestation is a big problem. Um, we could set out to look at deforestation across the continent and look at what look. It's 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 important to clarify that you know. There's a misconception that investigative journalism is is always just is you know finding sort of information that is that is hidden and secretive and you know collecting files in parking lots and that sort of thing. Mm -hmm. A lot of investigative journalism is just is 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 based on open source. What is actually available, it's, it may be a little hard to find, and you may need certain skill sets to be able to acquire that information and to make sense of it. Um, but it's not it's not always about information that is that is hidden and secretive and it's not always clandestine so if you're talking about something like deforestation we did a, a big project on deforestation um 
these are sorts of things where you can, if you know where to look, you can get a lot of data on, uh, you know, by satellite images through whatever trade data um, that that can feed into very long, complex investigative stories. It's not just about, um, you know, secret information. So, so in that sense, there's. A, yeah, you have to be frozen, but it's fine. Yeah, just you. So, so in that sense, you know, investigative journalism is often about finding what is out there. It's a, it's, it's a method. It's about, um, yeah. You know, there's a lot of room for sort of proactive investigation. So, I, I was just saying that sometimes uh, investigative journalist, uh, investigative journalism stories are are um, very proactive. We set out to answer questions on a particular topic. Uh, so for us, for instance, with a lot of say environmental stories, we can use, we can say we want to answer a particular question and the inf a lot of the time the information will be out there. We rely very heavily on, on open sourcing information that is publicly available. It just may be a little tricky to access or you need to know where to look for it. So for instance, if you're doing a story on the environment, satellite images, UN trade mm -hmm. data, et cetera, et cetera. A lot of this is, is available, scientific journals, et cetera. Um, on the other hand, there, there, is the, there is another side of investigative journalism that is, kind of, that is more, I suppose, responsive when you get leaks, when you get tip-offs. Um, mm -hmm. And a lot of ICI journalism has been there. So in this case, we uh, obtained this, this massive data set from uh, a nonprofit called Distributed Denial of Secrets which specializes in um, archiving big leaks, big data dumps like this. Um, so, you know, it's that in this case, there is a, there is a lot of these sorts of leaks out there. Uh, in this case, it seemed very, um, it seemed like a very worthwhile project. Um, you know, this was a, this was sort of one of its kind for, Africa. There hasn't been uh, a leak this big from uh, an institution like this, from a financial intelligence unit, in this case, the Eswatini Financial Intelligence Unit. There has not been a leak like this for Africa. Um, we had a similar leak from the, from the US equivalent of the Financial Intelligence Unit called FinCEN. Uh, we did a big project on that. Um, and it's very interesting because you know this is a this is a, a an institution dealing with very sensitive financial information, um, uh, and so it seemed like a no brainer to try and put together a team to deal with this. Uh, Eswatini is a very small country; a lot of our um, a lot of our readers would not be familiar with it. But mm. in that case, all the more reason to to um, to expose this, to write about it, uh, to tell stories about Eswatini. Generally, what we find in these, in these big data sets is that Africa is, is fairly marginal. So, you know, with Panama Papers, Paradise Papers, with the FinCEN files, you do get, um, you know, African politicians and businessmen cropping up. But generally, what we found is, um, is that, that uh, Africa is underrepresented, if you like. We did a recent project on... Uh, on on a leak from Cyprus, and there were you know you had loads of Russian oligarchs and sheikhs yeah. and princelings and business people from around the world. Again, generally Africa was pretty un unrepresented. We didn't do many stories uh, on Africa. And what's very interesting about this leak? Look, I mean the the information landscape varies very much across the continent, um, but there is in many African countries a bit of an information desert. Uh, you don't have the sort of inst uh, uh, you don't you don't have the sort of bureaucracies and the level of record keeping that you do in uh, in in uh, more yeah. developed economies. Yeah. Of course, that varies a lot. Um, if you look at South Africa, for instance, uh, you have a, a certain level of bureaucratic efficiency and and institutional development and and the channels. That the mechanisms, for instance, access to information, or that are there, that allow, um, that that allow journalists to access um, record keeping, uh, to access records, to access um, state documents, to access. You know, we have a um, what we call PIA, Promotion to Access of Information Act, in South Africa. That's 
by global standards, relatively progressive. It allows for a certain, for a type of investigative journalism that's very uh, data dependent, that relies on, on um, obtaining records, that in many parts of the continent is, is almost undoable. Um, mm. And, you know, for that, you need a relatively efficient bureaucracy. Okay, South Africa is flawed as it is, is relatively, you know, there's, there's a sort of base level of, of efficiency um, and institutional development and, and a base level of democracy as well. Um, I can just, a lot of the time, otherwise you rely on leaks, including... So, so I just, I don't, I don't want you to lose that thought. I want to ask something pointed yeah. around that. Um, you see, given the type of of leaks you deal with, given the, the global, not even continental uh, uh, footprint you have, what's the appetite for Swaziland, a small country, given the number of uh, documents or in, in, intelligence that you got? Do you then wear that against uh, what you have? And I'll give you an example. I'm asking this: If you get information about a country like Swaziland with 1.2 million people, and you are dealing with Panama Papers, dealing with real powerful individuals and organizations in the world, do you then wear uh, on the basis of that whether you could proceed with that or not? Sure. There's always a big, you know, the, the one of the overriding factors is public interest. You know, who are we dealing with here? What are we dealing with? Who are the victims? What what I mean, look, a lot, a lot of ICIJ's work has to do with illicit financial flows. You know, what mm -hmm. sort of quantums, what sums are we talking about here? And the Swazi leaks, you know, when when we weighed up the the public interest, when we tried to measure the public interest, it, it was fairly obvious we were looking at something serious. Swaziland mm -hmm. is is a is a small country, 1.2 million people, as you said, uh, small economy. But the amount of money sloshing through there was I think, in many ways, perhaps uh, uh, was was uh, quite alarming and and belied the you know relative uh, size the size of Swaziland. So you know it's, I mean, ultimately we are living in a very globally connected world, and mm. small economies play an outsized role in illicit financial flows globally. Mm. I mean, look at tax havens, right? They tend to be these tiny little islands. Mm, um, places like Mauritius, places like the Cayman Islands, um, and and Swaziland, uh, although it's not generally thought of as one of those sorts of tax havens up there with, um, with uh, say the Cayman Islands um, or Seychelles or whatever, there are certain we're we're seeing what we see in the leaks are certain sort of uh, similar characteristics. Um, and what we saw is how powerful individuals were exploiting vulnerabilities in the Swazi system, in the Swazi financial system, in the case of this bank, for instance, or the or gold refineries, these fictitious gold refineries, where we had um, prominent individuals connected to the king uh, moving money through this economy, through uh, Swaziland, in, in totally opaque and unaccountable ways. Um, and that's not just of interest to Swazis. That's of interest to everyone. Um, you know, mm -hmm. that, that, it, that particular case um, tied in with an illicit gold trade that involves Zimbabwe, South Africa, Dubai. Yes. Uh, and we're talking about millions and millions of dollars that these economies, that African economies are hemorrhaging at the expense of well, ordinary people and development. So, I, you know, to me, the public interest uh, question was answered very early on mm -hmm. uh, when it came to Swazi leaks. And of yeah. course, um, you know, Western readers, it, it's interest, it, it is an interesting case. You know, this is the last absolute monarchy um, in, in Africa. Uh, so that was automatically of interest to, to Western readers. Uh, and we have to think about Western readers when, um, when you're talking about an organization like ICIJ. Mm -hmm. um, so, yeah, basically uh, on, on every measure, these leaks sort of ticked the box. It, it was a no-brainer to, to pursue them, to put together a team and to invest a lot of uh, resources and energy in this. And it, you know, we were looking yeah. at these leaks for months. I think I started looking at them around this time last year.
Yeah, I mean, this is exactly the perfect time to bring Henny in because I know around this time last year, he was already quietly in the country, you know, and doing all of the necessary work. Well, um, when you were doing this and you were dealing with this information and knowing the extent and the scale of what you have, um, did you find that there were people inside the country who were willing to collaborate some of this information? And when you were in the country, did you get a sense that uh, you may be in a security threat uh, if the intelligence picks up that you already have this information? Because from as much as I can recall, from last year, you were already working on this and you were in and out of the country. Was there any point in time where you were worried that uh, if the intelligence picks up that you are hunting on this matter, you could be in trouble? Yeah, my mother, thanks very much. Um, you know, l l let, me, let me answer that by, by firstly just saying is that, you know, I, I think just quickly to add to what one or two things that Micah was just speaking to now, um, and, and maybe that helps in answering your question. I, I certainly agree that fundamentally the reason for doing this is, pu is the public interest. Um, and, and I think that's what all of the journalists share who have been part of the consortium. I think, um, you know, rightly, as Micah said, that there are different audiences that are interested and in, maybe ICIJ is particularly interested in helping a Western audience to understand that. Many of the partner organizations like Open Secrets are less interested in that Western audience and particularly interested in a Southern African audience, a global as well. But, you know, we want to speak to the region as much as we can. And for us, um, therefore, when we choose cases, we're also looking at matters and why this partnership is so important is to look at matters that people care less about. And, yeah. and quite frankly, yeah. uh, you know, it, it is a disgrace that the world cares so little about what is happening in Swaziland and Eswatini. Uh, it's a disgrace that it's an absolute monarchy in the, in the manner it is. It's a disgrace that leaders of the country like Tulani Maseko have been assassinated uh, and little is said. It's a disgrace that President Ramaphosa has frequent exchanges with the king uh, without, without this being called out publicly at every instance. It's a disgrace that the governing party and other parties didn't even send delegations to Maseko because a uh, funeral, you know, that list can go on. So, so the reason to do this is to be able to have a conversation about the issues in which we don't shine sufficient light on uh, and, and, and to try and expose those and for us then to have, you know, to, to understand what the implications are. And that's really important, particularly when the apparatchiks, the spokespeople, spokespersons for the government, like Alfius Numalo, I think, came out this week to suggest that this is some kind of a Western plot uh, against him while he showed us his big fancy watch on some Zoom call with Newsroom Africa. Well, the truth is, Mr. Numalo, uh, is that a conversation must be had about what is going on in Eswatini mm -hmm. also, because firstly, it matters to the people of Swaziland, of Eswatini, but secondly, it matters for the re for the, to the region, I think, as Michael was suggesting. If a small economy, a relatively small compared to South Africa or Mozambique, uh, economy like uh, uh, Swaziland is potentially criminalized. It becomes a haven for hot money, for money laundering. In the same way that small European countries like Luxembourg and Liechtenstein are criminal states, in the same way that Europe, United Arab Emirates is a criminal state that serves an entire region and increasingly the globe, we don't want to see that happen to, to Swaziland because the whole region gets sucked into that problem. We've seen mm -hmm wars in the DRC or the, the corrupt government in, in Zimbabwe, you know, the, the fallout in the region, right? So so mm. those are those matter suddenly not only to 1.2 million people, but suddenly it's a matter that matters to 150, 200, 250 million people, arguably. So so that's important. I mean, to your point around in invest, undertaking investigations, I know there are many investigative journalists, and importantly, we firstly, we recognize the role that investigative journalists, um, you know, yourself, colleagues at the bridge, many others in, in Swaziland face on a daily basis. Ours is just, uh, we are, you know, we, we are not from the country and we don't live in the country. And so we don't have to face the daily challenges. But I can certainly say that um, I think it was hard. It's hard to, um, it's hard, I think, in, in, in smaller jurisdictions where there's a tight control over various processes to get people to Put their names on record, and that's that's always you know it's very difficult, and and um, we've certainly experienced that, um, um, you know, and and I think that that's why we come to rely on things like leaks, 
Um, it's precisely because people won't go on record or where we have access to information laws like we do in South Africa. They are so poorly implemented that, you know, we 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 have this, this substantive, this framework to say, oh, don't worry, you can apply and the government will give you access. And very often the laws are there, but the state's response is to block you at every single turn. And mm -hmm. often they're you know, they're operating in cahoots with and in the interests of wealthy private people and co in corporations. So that doesn't mean we want leaks to be the only way, you know, to obtain information. But in a way, these are ways of last resort. It isn't just because, oh, here's a gift that arrived on our, you know, sort of our doorsteps. It's because precisely we can't access that information because people can't go on record. And why won't they go on the record? Because people are frightened. They're frightened of the repercussions of a security establishment. And, and you know, let me just say, uh, I, we, we, uh, I would love to be able to visit uh, Swaziland often again in my life, but I, I certainly, even when we visited, there were moments when uh, I, I will just say we felt a discomfort. And, and I think that was a, just a tiny taste of what it must be like to be uh, undertaking work like this in Swaziland. So I think for those people who are trying to do that work in Swaziland, in other countries uh, who face similar conditions, we, you know, we, we also just say much respect because, um, you know, that's really the front line of this kind of work as well. If but I can also, oh, sorry. Yeah, no, no, you, you can come, uh, well, okay, maybe you can, you can come in, but I just wanted something, just to say something that uh, just makes mention of the fact that he appreciates that there are people who are unable to go the full length given the restrictions in the country. But what do you say of the interlink between the banking system of Swaziland in South Africa and now the information that you have that these, is, that, 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 that these institutions could very well be vulnerable or being conjured to all of these hot men and all of that. And they may in Swaziland be able to, you know, to play around the laws and the policies and the regulatory institutions. But in South Africa, where these institutions are headquartered, talk of Standard Bank, FNB, all of the major banks in the country, they're headquartered in South Africa. So what role can those uh, in, in leaders in those institutions play in light of the information that we now know uh, that we've actually brought to the table? Well, well, you know, I think one of the things we 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 need to get corporate South Africa to well, firstly, we need to understand the interlinked nature of our economies between Swaziland and South Africa, and that's to understand the interlinked nature of big corporations, the banks, for uh, FNB, uh, First National Bank, uh, Ned Bank, Standard Bank, they all have. Um, a significant presence in Swaziland. And of course, there was an attempt to set up a so-called farmer's bank, which, you know, we really believe is a is a possible conduit for hot money that, that might be the intention of establishing that bank. But you've got these banks that are, are, are linked. You've got staff that move between the banks. Um, and, and in the same uh, vein, we've got big other South African companies, whether they're the fast food companies like Nando's, frankly, or it, uh, or it is a, a company like uh, MTN, which, of course, is a South African company with MTN Eswatini uh, operating in the country. Um, and I think what, what the corporations tend to want us to imagine is that these are all very much separate entities. Well, you don't, you know, these things are controlled from Johannesburg, and therefore the responsibility for what happens in Swaziland uh, is also lies with the directors and the managers of those banks in Gauteng who need to be held to account where those institutions are actively seeking to collaborate with repressive forces in other governments and certainly where they have helped enable possibly economic crime uh, in those countries. The, the requirements for due diligence, they can't simply say, well, the EFIU in, in Swaziland didn't properly inspect our transactions. That, that doesn't, you know, that isn't, that doesn't cut, cut, you know, that doesn't cut it. Uh, um, there are requirements for how they are intended to act in South Africa by law, and therefore, by extension, how they, how they, um, their subsidiaries uh, must act. So that is there. I just want to start Mangoba by not just looking at the way that Swaziland can contaminate. You know, there's an argument. Oh well, we'll Swaziland will contaminate the the pristine South African system. I'd rather like to see it the other way. The South Africans have a responsibility for. Mm. A uh, the abuse of power, enabling the powerful to retain their position uh, undemocratically in, in other countries where they play along and are in cahoots to make cash. So we say mm -hmm. they, firstly and foremost, should be held to resp responsible. But secondly, 
Um, uh, yes, absolutely. If you are going to dip your toe in muddy waters anywhere, you you know you can't think that that stuff just washes off uh, very quickly. You know, so so certainly those practices become part of the the way the company operates in in you know in in other places as well. And so they can't try and for those who you know believe in the virtue of these banks, for example, in South Africa, that we are foolish if we think that what happens in Swaziland stays in Swaziland, mm-hmm. right? These, these are there's a seamless connection. There may be different directors, etc., but they've all been in and out of head office, and they will return to head office at some at some point. So there's a responsibility of those corporations uh, to act within the framework of the South African rule of law and its democratic constitution wherever they operate. And then, of course, there's the you know the the risk of this arguably this contagion uh, you know that might might develop as well. So that's a conversation that isn't even being had, and and mm. I think that the corporations are playing. Like, you know, let's briefly say MTN is a good example of that. They, they imagine that there's MTN in, you know, held in, in South Africa, and then they can have operations in Sudan, in the DRC, and in Eswatini, and arguably as they've had in Syria and Iran in the past. Um, but with little thought about the connivance between MTN possibly and the regimes in those countries. And certainly we know that there's an esteemed shareholder of MTN in Eswatini who owns 10%. Well, that's a gift from what we understand, well, which is in the hands of the king. So if that isn't an indication that you are actively collaborating and supportive of an absolute monarch, then then, then very little else is. Um, and an understanding that you aren't able to operate without giving him a share of uh, you know, of your fortunes. Uh, and, and so, again, this comes to the questions of collaboration, of complicity, and the extent to which corporations are enabling systems that allow f- and, and that have allowed for very grave, serious human rights violations. Yeah, Michael, I want you to have a bite on that as well. But in addition to, to, to this, I want you to also give me a comment that um, any other democracy, even in the most established ones in Europe, you will have these kinds of malfeasance. And um, uh, I mean, it's not peculiar to Swaziland. But but you, the difference is that when such leaks happen, whether they are Julian Assange links, whether it's Snowden, but there is at least institutions that are willing. There is some uproar. There is someone who says this cannot go on. They can ventilate it in court. Uh, in any other regulatory board and institutions. Doesn't it not surprise you that in Swaziland, it's just life as usual, even with all of this um, uh, that uh, you've you've reported about on the one hand. But also on the one hand, how does the the powers of the institution of the monarch enable an environment where hot money, gold smuggling, and all of that can take place? Okay, so so there's... Three parts to that. I'll try answers. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> uh, well, firstly, Hen- Henny's sort of said it all about um, you know corporations operating abroad. Uh, I think you know, th- this is this is this is the reality of uh, the global political economy. Is that you? you know, there there are no uniform rules. Um, there are vast uh, disparities, in fact, in 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 terms of rules, and corporations routinely exploit that. Right. Um, so you know th- that's a kind of global uh, systemic problem um, that I think Henny's captured uh, pretty effectively. Um, you know, country uh, corporations that are guilty of bribery in Africa um, should be held to account there and should be held to account in w- wherever they're they're domiciled. Right. Uh, sometimes we see that, but I think the the, the norm is. Yeah, I think I think that's generally the the exception rather than the rule, right? Um, there have been some cases where uh, people involved, say, in corruption in the Congo, have been um, are facing litigation in in the states. Um, but but that is relatively exceptional, and and all the more reason why these why leaks like these are so important, uh, because they shine a light uh, on jurisdictions that are murky and secretive and and it's the only way we can know about the sort of uh, um, malfeasance that's happening there that is, that is uncovered in in these investigative stories um the second part of your question uh the reaction in in Eswatini look I mean 
these these leaks are still quite new. Uh, I, it's probably a little bit early to say uh, that the that the that the response has been um, relative silence, that it's been muffled. I I don't uh, I don't know what's going to happen in the next few weeks. We have more stories coming out. There, there clearly is um, if yeah, as as twenty twenty one. Uh, very starkly highlighted, there clearly is uh, a lot of dissent uh, within within the kingdom, uh, a lot of dissatisfaction with with uh, the government, um, and I don't know to what extent these leaks will bring pressure to bre- to to bear on uh, on the government. But one would assume that they would at least to some degree, given especially that Eswatini is so dependent on. Uh, neighboring countries and and international donors. Um, <clears throat> but part of the reason, I suppose, that there hasn't been a very open backlash is what leads me to the last part uh, of your question, is you know, the, the power of an absolute monarchy, um, where the king is above the constitution, where, arbi- where, where power is exercised often in very arbitrary ways, right? Um, which Henny highlighted very, very well in in one of the articles that Open Secrets did. Um, you know, the the reality is uh, that that there is a level of oppression that ensures that uh, that the lid is kept on um, on any sort of major backlash we might expect from from similar leaks in 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 a, a more de- democratic context. Um, what the leaks do show is that. While the king is rarely mentioned, he sort of looms large in the background. Um, you know, pretty much. So, I think most of the stories we've done uh, now and that we are planning to do have some sort of link to the royal family, right? In the in the gold story, we're talking about prominent individuals who, in one case, one claimed to be a friend of the king; the other individual is uh, related to the to the king is part of the royal family through marriage. Um, the king keeps sort of cropping up. King, the, the king, uh, or his proxies rather, keep cropping up uh, in, in these stories. Um, and that's hardly surprising when you consider that uh, the royal family is invested in all sectors of the economy, just about. Um, when you consider the, the staggering wealth uh, of the royal family. In this country that is largely impoverished, and you know, a country of 1.2 million people with a tiny with a tiny economy, of course, the king is going to be um, is going to be a central figure in 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 this in these sorts of stories. Mm-hmm. Um, so, yeah, I, I I don't know if that sort of answers your question, but the the, the thing is, what, what you know, another important thing to highlight is that there is. Clearly, from the leaks, uh, you know, it's, it's sort of in the subtext of the leaks, a level of unaccountability, not just when it comes to the king. I mean, the king is above the constitution, uh, that we all know, but people around the king get flagged routinely by these institutions. And there seem to be good people in these institutions, and these institutions are trying to do a job, but they keep running up against the power of the monarchy and the vested interests of people who are implicated. Uh, in illicit financial flows and other potential wrongdoing who are close to the king. Um, and, and we see these institutions flagging people, but we rarely ever see uh, positive outcomes. We rarely ever see these uh, investigations followed through. We, we don't see prosecutions as a general rule. And that is presumably because people are politically protected. Um, and the you, know, and it, you can have an institution like the EFIU that is nominally well, that is actually statutorily independent. So it's not just nominally independent, it's it's independence is enshrined in statute. But it is only as effective, really, you know, when it comes to to holding people accountable, it is only as effective as uh, the, the sort of weakest part in the system. Mm-hmm. Uh, because it refers, it may refer in uh, intelligence to, it may pass on intelligence to the Anti-Corruption Commission or the police or whatever. But if those institutions are captured or hamstrung by political interference, then these cases go nowhere. And we see evidence of that in the leaks. And I think, you know, it's, it's again, uh, something that underscores this, the public interest of these leaks.
Yeah. And I guess we are just concluding this conversation now. I just want to check, is there anything we must expect that's still coming from your from your table with regards to these leaks? And um, whether or not you said you just don't report alone, you campaign, you litigate, you do all sorts of things. Uh, what should we expect going forward? Yeah, I mean, thank, thank you. Um, I, I mean, I know that that there are, just to be clear, I think this, uh, this really phenomenal group of journalists, I think, as, as Mike has pointed out, from other publications, from Journal Freak, from Abu Bungane, from a range of other publications also working on the, on the matter. And so I would imagine we may or may not see more stories emerging um, in the weeks ahead. From Open Secret side, we are continuing to do our own digging. I don't think we want this to be a sort of one-hit wonder, um, uh, but there's, there, there, there are things, there are stories to be told. And so uh, I think we are all going to be working at making sure that we can do that. We want to turn up the heat uh, on the powerful, particularly those who are making that cash illegally, and uh, and 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 then we're going to be seeking ways to hold them to account. We're looking at legal strategies that um, are possible. I think, firstly, the element of truth telling is important. It's just putting that out there. It also gives the public an opportunity to consider the material, the evidence to digest it, and and I think what's really important, maybe just to point out as well to to viewers about leaks like these, is that you know one of the, the things that I think, um, I'm not speaking for ICIJ, but certainly I've heard this from Micah and, and their colleagues, is, is the importance of us not just disgorging information, right? You could take a database of eight, 900,000 documents and just make it available to everyone on the internet. And I understand why people um, would make that argument, but obviously there's also financial records that are private. Uh, all the records, some may be arguable. But that it's not necessary to share all of it because it's not in the public interest, right? Uh, there's all kind of data that's swept up, understandably, by an authority like the EFIU or other authorities that are similar in the US and elsewhere that, you know, tell the story of, you know, of of folks who are just busy with normal transactions and there's a question that might be raised. Our focus is on the powerful, on the politically connected uh, and where there's evidence of, you know, of that, that criminality um, or potential wrongdoing to tell that story. And then from our side at Open Secrets, we're certainly considering what are the, what are, what, what can we do in terms of particular legal strategies to hold them to account. Um, but, you know, I think that that work, we can do some of that from here, um, but it is important that this is the international nature of this work, in, including, we hope, you know, a space for people from Swaziland, uh, you know, activists, researchers, investigators, where they can, within the limitations that you face, to be able to tell those stories um, and, and to engage on them and to challenge the authorities when it comes to to you know to the evidence that's presented, and I think that's uh, that's work for the long haul. It, this isn't the solution. I think this is an important moment of us revealing an aspect that was hidden for so long. What we do with it now is really up to all of us collectively um, uh, uh, as we move ahead. So, are you, are you suggesting just last one? Are you suggesting that because the way that you are putting it is that you are being ethical with the information that you have. You are not just losing everything. You are focusing on those that are being assigned power and uh, the malfasters they may do. So are you allaying my fears that if, if you've got so much documents and you have my private information, that information will not be uh, all over the world and in the dark web and all of that unnecessarily, yet I've done nothing. <laughs> Yeah, I mean, I, I think Micah must really speak to that. But what I can say is that, you know, the, 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 let's, let's, we must talk about this very clearly because when you have, when you have government authorities uh, making an inference that these are acts of terrorism, you know, they use very big words that are used to punish people. Right, terrorism, state subversion, I don't know, they're throwing everything at the book. This is what frightened people sound like when they know the stuff that they want the world not to know. And this is not just their silly gambling habits or the stories about their lovers or what toys they're buying their lovers. There's all kinds of things we could have published we're not publishing. What we are publishing is the very clearly the material that's in the public interest. And, um, you know, I think there must be an ethical approach to 
any data that we come across as investigative journalists. Where we, we all come across material, um, for all of us who investigate these matters, similar matters, that is not in the interest of the public or for truth-telling, and that you have to kind of erase from your own memory bank, right? It's not, it's not relevant, and it shouldn't be the basis of gossip over you know, drinks late at night or something like that. And that's really important. The same obviously holds in terms of the integrity of the state. And I think Micah can speak to how I ICIJ has uh, managed that process. And uh, But it's very, it's a very important consideration. And we need to remind, the, you know, the, the corporations and the politicians um, that this isn't, uh, you know, this isn't a hit job. Uh, this is very considered and we act in the public interest alone. If that's going to make us a terrorist, well, well, you know, that says more about the powerful than it says about us. Yeah. yeah. Um, one last bite, Michael, on just exactly that, but also just you can add, of course, government says that you are, this is sabotage, this is financial or cyber terrorism and all of that, or even that you hacked the system. <laughs> what do you say about that? It just says a last shot. Look, I mean, I, I would just fully agree with Henny that these are the kind of knee-jerk responses you expect from um from powerful people who have things to hide and who are worried. Um, and, you know, on the point of the, the sort of delicate editorial balancing act um, and, and, and what we decide to, um, to publish, I mean, this is a very important question. I, and, and, you know, it, it is a, it's, a, it's part of the kind of professional editorial duty is to make those those decisions and they can be very difficult decisions right um but so to give you an example um we we owe it to our readers to be as transparent as possible um you know readers uh, are are at least one hopes discerning and expect you know don't they, they read with a critical eye and don't just believe everything you say you have to present the evidence and you have to present it in a compelling way um, and so, you know, we may want to say, for instance, reference a document or even publish a document to show, you know, this is what is being said, or this is this proves the, the point that's being made. Um, we are very careful in every instance not to put information into the public sphere that is that is unjustified. Um, that, you know, where, for instance, uh, like Henny said, there there are lots of. Um, very ordinary transactions. There's a lot of private information in these leaks where there's no public interest in, in publishing that. Um, so it's this balancing act between, between respecting those basic sort of rights to privacy and being transparent with our readers. Um, so if we, just to give you a, an example, if we have a document um, that, that has some very interesting, compelling information and in that we want to publish, we'll make sure that we redact that document of information that is irrelevant. And that was, that was something, you know, we were holding ourselves accountable. We're holding each other accountable in this project, in this collaborative project, um, ensuring that, you know, we, we didn't sort of transgress these golden editorial rules. And the rule, one of those rules was, you know, you don't publish information that isn't justified. And we all said to each other, you know, if, if we're going to publish these documents, redact any of that information that's that's um uh that's that doesn't justify publication and if you can't do that uh don't publish the document so these are and i, I just sorry to, to end off I, I wanted to speak to something Hedy said earlier about the value of these collaborations i mean i spoke about the kind of commercial imperatives and how investigative journalism is it's hard to to measure the sort of commercial value of it even for the public interest value is 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 often very obvious or is is, is very high, um, but there's also um, you know we're, we're bringing together in in a project like this a range of different organisations from different countries, from major corporate media outlets like Al Jazeera to feisty little you know non profits like Open Secrets, um, and and all of these you know while while all of these organisations uh, maintain very high editorial standards. They bring, you know, particular ways at looking at stories, particular, um, you know, particular unique features and, and and different audiences, and that is also the value of this collaboration. That that I, you know, I'm, I'm sort of echoing Henny here 
what he said earlier. When, yeah, I was talking about what what readers in the West may be interested in. But this is also, like Henny said, about highlighting, about telling people stories that they may initially, that, that don't get the sort of attention they deserve or that people may, may not think they're that interested in initially. You know, hidden stories. And in this way, in having a collaboration like this, you really reach a wide range of, of audiences. Um, and that's part of the beauty of it, I think. You know, we, we, we've got this, you know, we've got this country of 1.2 million people, this leak of documents from an obscure entity in, in Eswatini being carried on international news and being widely distributed through Eswatini and South Africa and the region. Um, and we've got a lot more stories coming, but I won't spoil. Uh, I won't spoil any secrets. Yeah, <laughs> thank you so much, Yankee. We really appreciate your time. Appreciate uh, the nuances and the behind the scenes thinking around these stories. So appreciate your time. Look forward to many of these stories that are going to come, and I do hope that the local media itself we're learning how to do these stories, but also how to treat information and how to package and present it. So thank you so much. Um, I appreciate your time. Looking forward to more of these stories, Micah and Henny. Have a beautiful day. Thanks, Mankoban. Thanks so much for the for the invite. Thanks.